Hey everybody, welcome back. This is part B of Fashion Inventory for Module 2. And please do not paste code from before. I am not going to follow that just because I'd imagine it's getting boring watching me type out the same assertion functions. Uh, so I got a couple of stuff copied into the replit already. Same idea as the previous problem in terms of what we have as our input. Current inventory, two designer objects, one for Brunello Cusinelli and one for Gucci. They want us to return the average cost of all shoes per designer in this format. So an object with one property, a key of designers, and an array, and inside of that array there's going to be an object for each designer object, where the name is the name, average price is an, the average of all the prices of the shoes for that designer. Uh, I'll challenge the course, test attach these exercises. Um, same idea, we're not going to be doing most of our work here, we're going to copy and paste it over to a replit and kind of organize our thoughts about how to solve the problem there. So. Function, calculate average price for designer, calculate helper functions if needed. Okay, so that's cool. Got an assertion function. What you're picturing here is that we're going to cheat a little bit, which is to say, excuse me, we're going to use uh, assert objects equal, which is essentially just going to stringify this object and compare it to a stringified version of what actually comes out of our function, and that'll be the comparison that we make. Now, the reason that we say that that's cheating is because you can't really guarantee that that's going to work. That's the sort of uh, contrived version of testing objects that we're using for the purposes of this prep course. Eventually, you might want to do a little bit of research into deep equals for objects. And it's what you would expect. You'd imagine that in order to be able to compare objects, you need to make sure that the exact structure of both objects is uh, consistent across both. And that involves making sure that any amount of nesting, which is to say that no matter how deep inside of the object more objects go, you still need to be able to account for that. And it becomes a little bit more complicated than uh, we really want to get into for right now. So what we do is we stringify both of them, and then after stringifying them, as we do here, we can just compare those strings directly. So I'm going to get rid of the spaces because we've already done the, the big reveal, as it were. So there are assertion functions. Here's our expected output. We want to make something called actual output. And we're going to set that equal to a call to our function, calculate average price per designer. And we're going to call that on current inventory, inventory, which doesn't actually exist yet. So what we'll do is we'll go over and we'll grab that from the problem page. Put that, let's say right here. So there's our current inventory, our expected output, our actual output. It's going to be calculate average price per designer called on the uh, current inventory. And then we'll make a call to assert objects equal, which we're going to copy and paste because there's enough letters in there to assume that we might misspell one. The first value is going to be our actual output. Second uh, argument is going to be the expected output. And we'll say for our test name, should uh, return expected object. Mm, that's a really bad test name. Uh, should return, uh, we'll say, properly formatted averages object. Sure. Again, same idea that we have for this problem uh, applies to the previous problem and is kind of different from the idea of testing with categorical reasoning. There's really not many categories for this. Of course, we absolutely could create a separate current inventory with all kinds of different things, different prices, and test to make sure that the average price works for a different version of this current inventory, although similarly structured. However, for the purposes of time, we're not going to do that. We're just going to compare it once. If it works, we're going to assume that our function works as expected. So if we think about this, I think that we have everything that we need in order to determine that the functions worked after the fact. So at this point, let's go back up and start thinking about the pseudocode that's going to allow us to transform this into this. So the first thing that you would want to look at is that the result the result of this function is going to be an object with a designer's key and an array property. Then, for each of the designers inside of here, each one of these designer objects, we're going to add the name and then an average gathered from these prices. So we could theoretically assume that there's something we want to do to each one of these objects that is then going to result in each one of these objects. To be sure, we're going to do this a little bit um, we are going to break one portion of this into a separate function, and we'll build that into the pseudocode. So let's return to the top, 
And the first thing we're going to do is create uh, a result object. Now I'm going to say result object because what I mean is an object that looks like this, but isn't quite full yet. So it's okay for us to use result object in this context. The last thing that we're going to do in this function is going to be return result object. And we might call that something, but for now, let's not really worry about it. Next thing we're going to do is iterate over the inventory. And like last time, we're going to start building some of this before we get all of the pseudocode onto the page. So the first thing we're going to want to do is say variable result is equal to an object, but it's not going to be empty. It's going to have as its key designers. We scroll down and you see how this is in quotes. That's actually the same as it being not in quotes. Those really uh, honestly mean the same thing. Uh, so designers is going to have as its value an array that will eventually fill with an object for each one of the designers in the inventory. So now that we have the structure established, let's return the result at the end. And for the iteration over the inventory, let's get that set up as well. We'll say variable i is equal to zero. i is less than inventory.length. And we spelled length right this time. And then from here, there's a couple different ways we could go. But what you would imagine is that here is where we could start building the object that is going to be the average price per designer like object. So we'll say create average price per designer uh, object. We'll assign uh, a name property to be the current designer name. And once we've got that, we'll then assign an, what are we calling it? Average price property to be the result of calling, uh, we'll call it get average uh, price. Sure, get average price function. So the get average price function is going to take in an array of shoes and it's uh, array of shoe objects and it's gonna give us back uh, our total average price. So let's write that down here. Function get average price. Get average price is going to take in an array of shoe objects. And it's going to calculate and return average price for all shoe objects. So We'll leave that undone for now, and we're going to assume that it works. We're going to assume that we can pass in basically this value right here for each designer, and then it's gonna give us back the price of all these shoes. Again, this is what we call wishful programming. The idea is that we assume that we're gonna be able to do this, and by doing that, we can separate the process that's necessary to get the average price from the process that's necessary to build the rest of this expected output. We assume that here, we're just gonna say, call a function, pass in a, uh, the shoes array and just be fine. So if that's the case, let's return back up here. And once we get to about right here, we'll need to push average price per designer object into uh, result.designers. Because result.designers is this value here. To this value, we need to add two objects. We're building them here and then we're going to add them to the result.designers array here. So let's get started. Average price per designer is going to be an object. The name property is relatively simple to assign. And we're going to do one other thing. We're going to create a few convenient aliases. The first one is going to be variable designer object is equal to, and again, I'm actually contradicting something that is in the coding style guide, but the coding style guide is one of those you wanna take with a grain of salt. Things like indentation are extremely important. Things like variable naming, we don't wanna call this variable uh, current thing, or X, or J, or something like that. Calling it designer object might violate the idea of calling something by the type of value it is, but as far as I'm concerned, if this is your first time going through it, calling it designer object is only going to help. 
I don't really think that it does anything negative, so I'm going to continue doing it. Variable designer object in this case is going to be inventory at i. So if we have a designer object, we'll also want to have a look at the shoes. So we'll say variable shoes, which is again that array of shoes, shoe objects, and we'll set shoes to be equal to designer object dot shoes. So we have two convenient aliases at this point. We want to remember that shoes is an array of shoe objects, and we get a little help on that by the name of this parameter here, but we just want to keep that in mind. So average price per designer dot name, which is what we're adding to it, is going to be equal to the name of the current designer object. So the current designer object has a name property, and we're going to assign to the average price per designer object that property, or the value for that property. Assign an average price property to be the result of calling get average price function. Sounds reasonable. So average price for designer, that's the name of the object. The name of the property is going, or the sorry, the name of the key for the property is going to be uh, average price, average price, and we're going to set that equal to our function get average price. And we're going to call that on shoes, which, if we remember correctly, is the array of shoe objects. Now, we assume that all of this works the way that we want it to. It will once we fill in that code, but it doesn't yet, and that's okay. We're assuming that it does, and since we are getting better at programming, it's a safe assumption. Push average price per designer object into result.designers. Fair enough. So result.designers, which gives us access to an array. We want to call push on that array, and we want to push the average price per designer, which is the object that we're creating for each designer. So now that that happens, result should look the way that we want it to. Now the problem for this is that what we would end up having is if we ran this right now, each object would not ha would have undefined as the value uh, for here because this function get average price is not going to return anything. So in order for us to get the rest of this function done, we need to start considering how we're going to get the average price for an array of objects, or sorry, for an array of shoe objects. So if we have an array of shoe objects, the first thing we want to do is create a sum variable, uh, and then eventually at the end of this, we're going to return sum divided by uh, input array length. And let's just say divided by. So we're going to sum up all of the shoes prices, and then the number of prices is going to be what we divide that total by, because that's how you get an average. And then we can get that by the length of the array of shoe objects. So create a sum variable, then we'll iterate over the array of shoe objects. And then for each shoe object, we want to add the price of the current shoe object to sum. And this is going to be one of those sum plus equals because we want sum to continue to accumulate all of the prices of the shoes. So with this in mind, creating a sum variable is relatively simple. Variable sum is equal to zero. The less return statement is also relatively simple. So this is going to be return sum divided by array of shoe objects, which is our input array, dot length. Now at this point, iterate over the array of shoe objects. You might be tempted to um, Actually, you might not be tempted to do that. Let's just use j. We'll say variable j is equal to zero. j is less than the array of shoe objects dot length. Just by the way, there wasn't an error in the video. I just decided not to say what you might be tempted to do because I honestly couldn't think of anything that wouldn't be more uh, uh, detrimental than hel um, helpful. So I actually didn't mention that. That's why that might sound kind of odd. However, if you've been watching a lot of these videos, you probably are starting to notice that that's the idea, is that this isn't scripted. It's mostly just me working on the problem, or my working on it, depending on if you are a stickler for English uh, uh, grammar. Anyway, add the price of the current shoe object to the, sum, to the sum. Let's get back to the code. So sum plus equals array of shoe objects. Mm, I want another alias. I want uh, my current shoe to be equal to array of shoe objects dot j. sum plus equals current shoe dot price. Current shoe dot price, because shoe is an object, it'll have a price property. That's going to give us all of the prices together into the sum. Then we're going to return the sum divided by the array of shoe objects, which is the input dot length. So now we have a function that gets us the average price for an array of shoe objects. We have another function, which is going to use that uh, function we just wrote 
to help create the object that's going to be stored in this designer's array. All of that is stored within our result object, and then at the end we return that result object. Once we have all of that, we look down here and we notice that we have an assertion function that's going to let us compare two objects, which is good. We have a current inventory that we're establishing as the input. The expected output is this, uh, this object right here. Excuse me. And line 86 is where we actually assign a call to our function we wrote above to actual output. And then on line 88, we're going to compare using assert objects equal an actual output, an expected output, and then a message to, to log to the console in the event that we're incorrect. So I would say that I think everything that needs to be done for this problem has been done. A couple of areas where some vertical white space might be, um, might be a good idea to get rid of, but that's not really that big of a deal for us. Right now we're going to run and just see what happens. And we're in good shape. So at this point we can go ahead and copy all of this, return back to the input, scroll down, paste it in. And in case you're curious why this says submitted, I haven't been able to figure this out either. I think it's a bug going on with something that I changed from a previous version of the course to the current. Uh, don't worry about it. As we've described previously, most of what you're doing for these problems in module two is about what we did over here, the reasoning and the code that we wrote, and then the proof that the function works. Once you get back over to here, this is not as important, but if you're like me, you like to see that it was correct, so you hit run test and it tells you that it's correct. Anyway, Hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.